Here's something I haven't tried on this channel before. Canadian whiskey. This week, I'm going to be trying Bareface. Grr. <laughs> Yay or nay? No, I was good. Hey guys, I'm Nath Martin, the Whiskey Scribe. I'm a whiskey enthusiast and I love all things whiskey, including Canadian whiskey. But taste is subjective and there's a lot of different whiskies out there. So whether you consider yourself a connoisseur or you're just looking to understand more about whiskey, let's explore it all together. If you'd like to see more from me, consider subscribing. You can also follow me over on Instagram. And if you do enjoy this video, please do give it a like. It really does help me out. Bareface whiskey, although it's new to the Australian market, it's not necessarily a new whiskey. It's been available in Canada since I think about 2019. It's labeled as a single grain whiskey and the grain is corn, but it's actually about 99.5% corn with 0.5 malted barley added. That's not uncommon for a corn based whiskey. Usually you're adding that malted barley in there because it helps the enzymes break the carbohydrates down into sugars so that they can be turned into alcohol. It's still considered a corn whiskey, it's just part of the process. But Bareface isn't actually a distillery, it's They've contracted whiskey to be made by other distillers and then they're going through the process of aging it to their specifications. And that's because they're more concerned with the actual aging process itself. So this is the first release they've got. It's called Triple Oak. They do actually have a new release out now, um, which it's probably going to be at least five years before we see it in Australia. Who knows? Um, but this one, it's called Triple Oak because it's spent time in three different types of casks. So it spends the first seven years in spent bourbon barrels. So this is ex-bourbon barrels that have been used so much that there's no character coming through. They're just allowing it to have that time just to develop as whiskey without too much flavor imparted. They then spend some time in French oak barrels that have contained heavy red wines, and they're doing that to try and impart some of these really fruit sort of flavors in there. And then finally, they spend time in dried Hungarian oak casks. And the point of that is, it's meant to infuse some more spicy sort of notes that would almost give the impression of a rye whiskey. Now, the other really interesting thing is they like to advertise this as elemental aging, elementally aged, um, which, so they're putting the barrels in shipping containers and they're putting them out in wilderness areas to let those barrels take on those natural elements from the environment, which is very similar to the way a lot of um, regional Australian whiskey distilleries operate, just out of habit of where they are. If you look at Kings Lake, they're right in the middle of a patch of bushland, so they get a lot of the eucalyptus impression. So it's kind of cool that somebody in Canada is taking that on as well. But this one's not exposed to Australian wilderness. This is exposed to the Canadian wilderness, and it's in a very bare heavy area of Canada. <laughs> So which is where that branding comes in. You've got the bare face name, you've got the scratches on the label, which is really cool. Um, as a marketer, I actually, I really appreciate good branding and this looks like something that Logan from the X-Men would drink. But the point of the elemental aging, it's not just so that bears can rub themselves on the barrel to impart their musk. It's also the, the variance in temperature. In the areas where this has been aged, the, the temperature ranges from about zero to hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And if you're not, if you're, amongst the rest of the world using the metric system, that's more like about negative 17 degrees Celsius to 37 degrees. So a pretty wide range. There's not really any whiskies in Australia that have been aged in sub-zero temperatures. I could talk a lot more about their marketing story, but you can find that on the website. So let's just get into the whiskey. So this one's bottled at 42.5%. And I noticed on the website that previous bottlings and things state seven year, like the seven year age statement on there. For some reason, the bottling that we've got here in Australia doesn't say seven years. I don't know if what we're getting is a little bit younger. I don't think so. But anyway, if you look at it though, it's got sort of like this golden, almost caramel color to it, which is pretty typical of corn whiskies. I don't know if, I'm just holding this up to the white light to try and see. I think, I did think there was like a faint hint of the red color in there, but I think that's only because I know that it's been aged in red wine casks. It's not really, there's not really any red coming through there. But it's got nice oily legs, which is always a good sign. On the nose, I know that Hungarian oak is meant to give the impression of rye whiskey. 
but this is unmistakably a corn based whiskey. I'm getting literally buttered corn. I do get the oak, oak coming through from the barrels. There's quite a lot of sweetness coming across from the corn, which makes it a little bit hard to pick up, but there are some sort of earthy kind of spicy notes in there, but they're pretty faint. I have to say the alcohol is actually quite thick for something that's 42%, but sludge. Again, as somebody who doesn't drink a lot of corn-based whiskey, the first impression I get on this is the corn. So I'm sort of having to let my palate break through that a little bit before I can taste anything else, which is my very sophisticated way of saying I need to drink more of this before I can give any assessment. Okay, so you saw that those legs are quite nice and thick. That does give it a really nice oily kind of buttery mouthfeel. And combined with the corn, it sort of develops into this butterscotch sort of flavor, which is quite nice. I get, in terms of fruit, I kind of get like a little bit of apricot, but not, not like fresh fruity apricot. I'm talking more about like, you know, apricot preserve. The oak is there, but it's very much subdued by all that sweetness. And then, so I did try this yesterday and most of what I got yesterday when I tried it was like the sweetness of that corn. And I was actually kind of disappointed because I was looking forward to how that Hungarian oak would impart that spiciness. But I have to say, it does sit more on the back of the palate in the finish. So you've taken a few sips, you've, you've let it sit for a little bit and you've exhaled and then that's where you sort of, that spiciness picks up. In fact, I even, I had this with dinner last night and it was a very lightly spicy chicken and that really activated those spicy notes in the whiskey, but it is quite smooth on the palate. For something that smelt like it was gonna be quite high ABV in spite of that 42%, on the palate, it's, it's quite smooth. It's very easy drinking. Personally, for me, this isn't something that I would probably, it's not something I would sit down to unpack. It is a session whiskey. Um, I would sit there while having a few drinks with a few friends and having a chat. I would drink this one and just enjoy the flavor because it's subtle and it's easy to go through. I'd probably also throw it in a cocktail, but it is a nice whiskey. And I've heard, so they do have a second edition that has been aged in a different area, I think. And that's meant to have, it's the same whiskey, but it's aged in a different area. And it does apparently impart some different flavor notes. So if that comes to Australia, it'll be really interesting to compare these two. In fact, I'll try and hold on to some of this so that I can. But all in all, for a new Canadian whiskey in Australia, and it retails at about, I think, 80, $85 at Dan Murphy's, that's actually pretty nice. I quite like that. There are worse imported whiskies out there for higher price points. And that butterscotch just... The butterscotch develops more and more the more you actually drink it. I'm... I'm liking this more and more as I come back to it. Maybe it does have a bit more to unpack. I jumped the gun on you. I apologise. So, although that's a corn whiskey, and I know that Canadian whiskey has a lot of this impression that it's very rye heavy. There's actually not really any standards in, in Canada that specify that whiskey has to be rye or corn or anything like that. You can sort of use any of the seven grains that you want. It's just this habit that most Canadian whiskey does have a large proportion of rye in it. So it's really interesting that this one doesn't. And yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm very glad that it is different. It's something a little bit more unique to follow through. So this may not be typically representative of Canadian whiskey, but that's fine because life is all about exploring different things. So I would say this one is, is worth a try. If you have tried this one though, or even the second edition, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I would, now that I know that there's another edition, I would really, really, really love to be able to compare the two. But if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. 
If you want to see more from me, consider subscribing. Enjoy what's in your glass, no matter where it's from. And slash. Hey.